Uh, we're in Lesson 7 uh, on page 57 of your book. I'm going to open us in prayer, and we can get into it because we got a lot to cover. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's go to prayer. Father, we praise you and thank you for your word. Thank you for what it has to say to us and what uh, the Holy Spirit speaks when he, when he moves in our hearts uh, through the living word. We praise you for this time, for everybody in this class and the, the attitudes they bring. We pray that this would be an uplifting and glorifying uh, session and you'd help us to understand what you have us to understand. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. 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 I talked to a friend of mine um, who teaches a small group here at, at Silverdale Baptist, and he had decided with his small group to, to uh, go with a curriculum that was a Bible study curriculum, where they're going to look in the scriptures and, and talk about the Bible. They're not going to use another book and that sort of thing. And uh, he was sharing with me that uh, he, likes, he does a study, and then he asks probing questions um, that uh, he's learned how to do, and he's got a person who comes to his class and brings a commentary. And every question he asks, she just reads from the commentary. Uh, and that's it. She never expresses her own thought. She just reads from the commentary whatever the commentary says on that verse, on that particular word. Um, and that's bad. You know, it really is bad. That's the typical inch deep, mile wide Christian who, who is um, dependent upon a book that somebody else wrote that's not inspired uh, and uh, be like uh, hauling pastor around. And every time anybody asks a question, you say, well, what do you say? And then say, this is what pastor says. Um, so we... We, we want to get, uh, and your, I know your desire, I'm talking to the choir here, your desire is to get uh, dependent upon the scripture and not dependent upon some book or some writer uh, other than some, the writer of the scripture. Now, this lesson, what you're really doing in this lesson was you are writing your own commentary on verse 2. That's literally what a person that writes a commentary does. He takes the words. Sometimes he'll take just the key words, but he, he then writes an explanation of what those words are with some cross-references and that sort of thing. And it's it, if you run across a verse that you're having a hard time really understanding, it's good. This is a good tool for sitting down and really dissecting that verse and really getting into the meat of the verse and having to think about each word and what it means. Now, on Sifting the Ore on page 57, this idea is when, when Jesus, even Jesus, when he does combat with Satan, uh, and Satan misquotes scripture to him, Jesus' answer was from the word of God. And he says, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So, in this lesson of our Bible study methods, we are concentrating on every, re, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And this, again, is why a good translation is important because we want to know as close to every word that the translation has. Not every phrase, but every word. So that's this idea of considering each word in a verse will take us to a, what we did uh, in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. So, um, let's get into this, because we have some discussing to do. So let me pull this down. Can you see that? Verse 2, right there. Um, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is good and acceptable and perfect. Okay. Um, on the next page, on page 50, 58... I gave you a list for sifting the words. We're taking the, the, the chunks, the ore from this verse, and we're sifting it as fine as we can sift it. And I basically gave you, I, I tried to make it simple by saying, you got one tool, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary. 
just to see what kind of what kind of results you can get from that and uh, we're going to talk more about that as we go but here the so the first word and so what did that where did that get you defining that word immediately if I'm going to study verse 2 I'm done I'm done at verse 1 or at the first word because I have to find out what the ands for okay so if it says and I go oh well I automatically have to find out what's what's it connecting there's something and what it's going to talk about in verse 2 so I have to stop my study of verse 2 and go to verse 1 now I got a problem with verse 1 therefore there it is I urge you brethren by the mercies of God so what's the first word of verse 1 therefore, therefore. so what's that mean it is a conclusion based upon something. It's not a connection. It's a conclusion. There's this, and because there's this, therefore, I'm going to make a, a statement. So verse, the first word of verse 2 takes me to the first word of verse 1, which takes me to the entire book of Romans from chapter 1 to chapter end of chapter 11. Okay? The end of chapter, the, the verse, I, I think I've got it in this, let me pull it up. You could say a summary of the first, of the first uh, uh, 11 chapters is for, from him, through him, and to him are all things. All right? To him be the glory of God forever. Therefore, okay, since everything is from him, everything is through him, and everything is to him, therefore... Present your body as a living sacrifice, right? You see that in verse 1. And then, so we go, okay, so I've done it. I've stopped my study of verse 2. I've looked at verse 1. I've looked, maybe I've, I've recapped. Maybe I've stopped and spent uh, a few hours, maybe a, maybe a week, looking at the whole book of Romans. Maybe I've looked at an outline from my Bible handbook of what the first section of Romans was about. Kind of got an idea of that. Therefore, verse 1. Okay. Now there's a shift in Romans. The first 11 chapters of Romans is doctrine. From Romans 12 on is about living the doctrine. And there's your shift and that, it, that it comes with. And it's based on the first two verses of 12 that launch us into living the doctrine. So the, just the word and, do you see that? Where and can say, ask him the question, what does and mean? It'll take you places in your Bible study. So the next word, do. What'd you have? Carry out. Okay. What else? Anybody else? Do another's wishes. Okay. Do. Do the Performing. Okay. It's it is an action word. Okay. So if you're a Christian and say I really don't want to do anything, you got a problem. Because this is, and, do. This this would be so in your commentary you're saying. Verse 1, in addition to verse 1, take an action. Okay, what's the next word? So what does that mean? Okay, it's, an, it's a negative. So, and it's connected to do. So now this is an action, and it is a command for a negative action. This is something not to do, Right? So the first thing I'm thinking about, this is a negative. Okay? Everybody making, everybody with us? That's where, and just your dictionary is telling you that. Now, you, you can define, you can technically define the word not. But you also have to say, okay, with that technical definition, how it fits in the verses that I'm just, uh, just saying. This is a negative not, is a negative of do. Do not. 
B. What'd you have? State of being. State of being is where I ended up. Um, so if, if I'm saying, this is something telling me to take an action or to not take an action of being in a state, a state of being. So I could stop right there and say, ask myself, wait a minute, well, exactly what state of being am I in right now? Stop right there. You see what I'm saying? It could take you, you could go deep right there based upon thinking about this is a command not to be something. Well, if it's a command not to be something, maybe the first place I had to do is evaluate what I am being. And then I can see if what I am being is going to be good or bad in the verse. So a state of being starts to get me thinking, okay? I'm not ready to stop yet, though, so I'm still, this is a state of being. So it's in addition to verse 1, take an action that is a negative, it's a negative action about a state of being. Or a state of existence. What's the next word? This this is a great word. All right. What does conform mean? To be similar or identical. Same shape. Yeah. Okay. Break break the word down into its two parts. Con, form. Con means with. Uh, chili con carne. It's from Latin actually, but chili con carne is is chili with meat. So it's it's conformed is with form. Okay? So it says, don't be with a form. So I'm starting to ask myself the question. In my existence, in my state of existence, am I conformed? Do I have a with form of something that I shouldn't? Because it's a negative command not to. So I can start to say, wait a minute. Am I conformed to something? You see where it starts to take us at a deeper level? Just by defining the word. And just by looking at the words, I can start to, to get a deeper meaning. Conform me with form. Now, to means towards, right? Uh, this. What do you have for this? This is present. Present. Where where you are. Okay? It's not it's not that. It's this. So it's do not be in your form of existence, in your in your state of existence, do not be with form of this current where you are world. Now, in the world, you have some definitions. What are they? What's it mean? Society. Okay. Okay, so it, it could be the physical world. It could be the social world. It could be the spiritual world, right? And we know from being Christians a long time that one of the things about, oh, the world is this cultural system, right? So it's a moral system. But it could also be this physical world or this social world or this spiritual world. And we've got a command on all three of those things that would make sense. Don't be conformed to this physical world because it's not about physical. Don't be conformed to this cultural world because it's not about the culture. Don't be conformed to this spiritual world because the spirit, this spiritual world is not the biblical spiritual world. So we can start to say, so we've got a negative command not to take an action of being with the form of this world where we're in. So I can stop and say, wait a minute. I need to really ask myself some hard questions here. That nugget is telling me something 
there's a command from the scripture, I need to ask myself, what am I conformed to? Now, I've been a Christian 50 years, almost 50 years. Just recently, I love movies. My dad used to work in movies. He, I grew up him taking me to movies and telling me about how he built the sets and how he did all this stuff. Uh, so I love movies. And I happen to love action movies, science fiction and action movies, with the action heroes and all that stuff. Fantasy kind of thing. Don't really like girl, you know, chick flicks, but I, I go to those once in a while. <laughs> but very recently, I was reading Isaiah, uh, a verse that said, do not envy a man of violence. And I'm reading along, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me. When I go to a movie, I am celebrating violence. I say, well, it doesn't have any swearing, and it doesn't use the name of the Lord, you know, and it doesn't have any sex in it, but it's violent, but it's just violence. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit started to say to me, don't be conformed to this world that the reaction to things most of them are basically on vengeance. It's a nice guy, something happens to his family, and he goes off and he becomes this action hero and violent person. There is a case where I had to ask myself, am I conformed to this idea of celebrating violence? Is that the biblical Christian perspective to have? So let's see where that can take us deep. Now we're talking about a vein of truth that we can refine into a real treasure, right? And that's where your, you, your Bible, and a dictionary and your mind can take you to that kind of a spiritual exchange with the Lord. That's Bible study. Now, don't be conformed to this world, but... One of my favorite little words. What does but mean? Contrary. Okay. Contrary to what just went before. Okay. Something but something. Okay. So it says don't be conformed to this world. That's a, a, a command of a negative action. Do not be conformed with the form of this world. But... Ah, so I'm going, okay, now I'm going to get the alternative of not being conformed to this world, right? So the word but is, oh, it's a good word. I love that. But, be. Now that's, again, a state of existence, okay? So we're getting don't be, but be, okay? And the next word is what? Now. What does transform mean? <clears throat> to change the form. Okay. Um, we break it down into, into transform, right? So what does trans mean? If I have a transatlantic flight, what does that mean? A cross. A, 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 a transcontinental railroad is a cross. Uh, TWA, Trans World Airlines. Uh, so it's the idea of going across something, right? Across what? The form. It's the same word. Conform or transform. With form or across form. So all of a sudden I can connect the word conform, not to, and the word transform, they're both form. So I need to be, be concerned about the form, okay? So am I conformed? Am I with the form of this world? Or am I passing over the form of this world? That, is, that can take us to some medi medication. <laughs> Meditation. <laughs> or medication, I don't know. Uh, we, you say, I'm in trouble, I need to medicate. But you see where we're going with this. You see how this works. 
So all of a sudden, I could do stop, and I could do a, a with my concordance, for example, I could do, or my Bible dictionary, I could do a comparison between the word conform. What verses talk about conform? I could look in my concordance and look up conform verses. And how many of them say don't conform? A lot of them. And I could look up transform. What? We're, we're transformed. We're, I could look up transformed. That's a great biblical word. And we're commanded not to be with form of this world, but to be transformed across the form, change the form, vary the form, whatever. So I'm going to be not conformed. I'm going to be transformed. Now the word by. Now if we, what? To be near. Okay, that is, that is one, to be near. What's another word for by? What'd you get? According to. According to, right. What's another one? Any other definitions? Through the medium. Through the agency of is, is what this one is talking about. Now, you could say by means to be near. Okay, transformed near to what? Okay, that'll work. But if I think through it, it's, what it's talking about is be transformed through the agency of. That's what this by. It's by. Okay? That makes sense? What I'm, the difference? Now, even if you said, oh, it just means to be located. That's okay. It'll still take you to where the verse wants you to go. You don't have to be rocket science here. The, but, but if you look at the whole definition and start to think through these various things. All of those definitions were right. And all of them work for our thinking. But all of a sudden we come to the one that says uh, through the agency of and go, oh, it says be transformed by the. What do we get for the? What does the mean? See, I want to show you these little words make a big, huge difference. Let me put it this. What is the difference between the and a? Uh? What have you read? Be transformed by a renewing. Specific. A uh is general. Okay? If you say, oh, Jesus is a son of God. That's the Mormons. Okay? No, Jesus is the son of God. He is the specific only son of God. Huh? designates a specific so it's saying be transformed by or through the agency of the by the specific now we're talking about one not a but there is one way to be transformed by the renewing now I promise you you could stop and do a whole study on renewing what did you get to make new again, restore. to restore. Okay. So if I'm going to renew my mind, what is a condition of that? If I'm going to renew my mind, what is a condition of that happening? Start fresh. Okay. What if I say renew? It needs to be made new again. Again. See, to renew my mind, it has to be new once before. It had to have been new once. This is not the this is not changing completely. That's conversion. This verse is not talking about the conversion experience. This is talking to Christians about going back to the newness of your mind, the newness of your thinking. And I thought of Ephesians or um, Ephesus, Church of Ephesus in Romans in uh, Romans, Revelation chapter two, where where Jesus says, "I have this against you that you have." lost your first love. What do they need to do? They need to renew their mind. They need to go back to that first love. So I stop and go, wait a minute. I have to think about it. I've been a Christian for almost 50 years. What was my thought process when this was so new that everything was just this stark blessing? 
Have I lost that? Have I lost that by being with the form of this world? Ha has, has this world sucked me away from my new mind where I looked at everything from the aspect of oh, Jesus loves me and boy, this is all new and I can read a verse for the first time? Have I been sucked away where I now need to be transformed back by renewing? Or even like the monitor thinking how he intended you to have it, that sin in the world has, and he wants you to get back to how That's right. you originally wanted it. So it, what we're seeing in these verses is we're seeing a movement. Don't be with that form, but be transformed. How? By going back and renewing that mind. Okay? Renewing, okay, of is um, to look for the object of the action. If I say of, first thing that says is uh, I have to look for it's of, of what? I have to look for what is the object of this action. Of, of the Lord, of sin, of what? So the word of automatically says I have to search for what the object is. Your. What'd you get there? Pertaining or belonging to you, possessive corresponding to you. Oneself. Oh, oneself. So it's it's possessive of self. Okay. It, he's not saying my, which would be possessive me. He's saying your. This is to the audience. So if you go back and say, okay, who's the book of Romans written to? It's written to Roman Christians. Okay? So it's written to us. So if he says your, he's talking to me. And he's talking about my possessive. What, what do I possess? By the renewing of something I have what is it mind so now we can stop I, I went when I studied this um, I came to this so you can you can see this little line here I went mind and I drew a line down here to the bottom and I went my mind uh, my definition of my mind what's in my mind my perceptions my understanding my opinions, my knowledge, my views, that's my mind. And I have these cross-references for that. And we're going to come to Philippians 4.8 in just a second, but I can stop and say, wait a minute. What is my mind focused on at this moment that is conformed to this world? that needs to be transformed into something that's a renewal. You see how, how, how deep that can take us, that if you could read through Romans 12, 2, just whew, now you're not going to be able to ever read through it that way again. When you come to Romans 12, 2 in the future, you will haltingly go through that because those words speak to you because you've stopped and defined them you study something it it becomes yours and speaks to you deeply uh, that's bible study a commentary doesn't do that for you <laughs> uh, bible study will so i can stop and say wait a minute boy my mind where does my mind go well, maybe I, I watch pornography. What am I filling my mind with? Maybe I read slutty books or, you know, whatever. What am, or stupid science fiction books. What, what am I filling my mind with? Boy, that's a tough, that'll take me someplace. God and I will do business in the dark with that, right? Where's my mind dwelling? Is it dwelling on Scripture? Is it dwelling on your world or is it dwelling on this world um, and it you, it goes on uh, I'm going to very quickly for the sake of time so is in order that 
that is a specific. Now, it's not this. Th now it's that you may. So that you may, you the reader, may, is it could, it if done, prove. Um, what does prove mean? Validity to 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 prove it is to is to test and and show validity. It's to prove it. Uh, it isn't just to say it. It's to prove it. So there is a confirmation. Uh, this is a specific uh, confirmation that says, without doubt, I can show this. I can prove what is the object of the evidence, okay? The specific again, will. So what's will? This is, this is like world. There's a bunch of different definitions. Uh, your choice, your, your desire, your plan, my, my will. It could also mean my will, as in my last will, is what I bequeath. Okay? All of those work. The, the desire, plan, and bequeathal of God. Okay? I can prove what the plan of God is for my life, what his bequeathal is for my life. Do you see that? Any of those definitions takes me to considering this verse as meaningful in my life, to be a nugget, to be processed into treasure that's going to change my life. Now, I want to go back to, what were you going to say? I, I can see she's going to make a point. There's a to beside prove. Uh-huh. And the word over on the column says to approve. Does that mean to desire and approve of his will and plan over your own? No, it's not, it's not approval in the concept of we have to agree and approve. Okay. It's, it's approve as in it's, it's been shown to be approved. It's, it's the official thing. It's the approved thing. It's not approved like I've got to give my consent. It's approved. But see, that question could take you places. Okay, I need to study this. So you need to now go to the Greek. You need to go to use your concordance. You need to see cross-references for that. Uh, ultimately, you might go to a commentary about it. But you can do it just on that question. What does approve mean? Wait a minute. Does this mean I have to approve it? No, no, no. This means it's what God has approved. He has put his seal of approval on this thing. Um, yeah. So, so all of a sudden I could say, well, I can stop and say, okay, wait a minute, I need to do a Bible study on what is the will of God. If, if I need to, to prove what the will of God is, and I go on and say, that which is specific, good and acceptable and perfect. Now, um, let me go back up here. I went over into a Bible study on those three words. What is good? What is acceptable? And what is perfect? What does perfect mean? If it's perfect, what does that mean? Flawless? It, it finished? It's complete? That means it can't, nothing can be added to perfect. It's done. It's complete. It's finished. It's also a word that is used in the scripture for mature. Uh, if you're perfect, it's not perfect as without flaw. It means to be mature. So you could, it could take that. What is mature? So I need to be thinking all of a sudden in my, in my Bible study, I think, what is good in my life right now? What is acceptable is it acceptable to me or is it acceptable to the one I belong to is it acceptable to God so if I want his will it's what is good as far as his will is concerned what is acceptable as far as his will is concerned what is perfect as far as his will is concerned now I got to do some business because that verse has taken me very deep into a truth that I've got to deal with just by defining the words from a dictionary. 
Did you like that tool? I hope. Now, in the future, you don't have to do every single word and write two sentences. I, I, I put, pulled, pulled one up out of my notes from, from 1971, where I did this in a class, and I did it phrase by phrase. So when it said, uh, uh, what, the, what the will of God is, and I talked about that. So you could do that. It's, this is a tool you use the way you want to use it. But I wanted to show you that just a dictionary and stopping and slowing down and using your mind will take you someplace. Now, if I go to what is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect, and I start doing some cross-referencing, I come to Philippians 4.8, which says this, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, re report, if there is any excellence, and if anything is worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Is there any similarities? It's talking about your mind and what your mind is dwelling on. So all of a sudden, I can use Philippians 4.8 as a cross-reference to think about, I, I have a list. Remember, I love lists. I have a list. I can stop now on this. I have this little list of good, acceptable, perfect. That takes me to a cross-reference of true, honorable, right, pure, lovely, good report, excellence, worthy of praise. So I can stop and say, wait a minute. In my life right now, what is true? What do I absolutely know is true? What is honorable? Uh, what is right in my life right now? What I'm doing in this world right now, am I conformed to what the world says is right, or am I being transformed into what God says is right? You see what I'm saying? You know, these verses will go across and take you deep. This, these are shafts. You could, this is a nugget. Say, oh, honorable. Wow. All of a sudden I can say, am I honorable in my job? Am I honorable in my family? Am I honorable in my church? Am I honorable before the Lord? Can I stand before the Lord and, ga and his gaze be upon me and say, Lord, I am trying to live with a mind that's honorable. I'm letting my mind dwell on the honorable. Does that mean my mind is dwelling on Captain America? And that he, I got to a movie that kills 70 people, body count. Is that an honorable thing for my mind to dwell on? Yikes. Okay. But see, we go very deep by your going through one verse with a dictionary and then thinking about that. You all with me? Is that is that good? Is that, a, is that a good thing? I hope so. Because if it isn't, tough. That's all I got for you. Uh, <laughs> that's all I got. Um, now, I've, what I've been talking about with uh, uh, the word uh, my mind. Oh, by the way, just an interesting thing. Uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, uh, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Okay? Verse 1 says, Therefore, I urge you to present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your good and acceptable worship, form of worship. Right? So the first verse is talking about what? My physical body. This is, where I, this is why I became a vegetarian. It really is. This, is, this verse changed me. Am, am I offering my physical body. So verse 1 is talking about what you're doing with your physical body. Verse 2 is talking about what you're doing with your mental process. So God is not just interested in what I am intellectually or what I am just spiritually. He's also really interested in what I am physically. I was doing a Bible study off of this, this idea, and I went to, I was reading in John, 
where Jesus takes the takes the uh, cat of nine tails and he goes nuts in the in the temple, clearing off the the cheaters and the money changers and all that stuff. Right? Remember that story from Sunday school? He goes crazy, and it says, and his apostle says, Ah, this fulfills the verse that says his his zeal for for the temple of God. Right? He was consumed by his zeal for the temple of God, and all of a sudden it struck me. Wait a minute. Scripture says, I am the temple of God. And if he is that concerned about clearing a building of crap, how concerned is he about clearing this building, his, his real temple, the temple of the Holy Spirit? Is he as zealous about clearing me out of my cheating ways? Well, gee, that takes me back to not being conformed to this world, but being transformed by the renewing of my mind. He wants me to be transformed. And he is zealous for me to be transformed in my body and in my mind. That'll preach. That'll pr you could do a Bible study for a while on that, a series. <clears throat> Anytime us preachers find find something that'll preach, that's we go, yeah, that'll preach. Okay, on page sixty, sifting uh, the ore through meditation. When I've when I've been talking this whole time, when I say, okay, it means conformed or transformed or renewing, and and I say, no, I stop and think about that, and think about what am I renewing? Am I in the process of continually renewing my mind or is it old and stale and am I there I haven't renewed anything lately except my driver's license I mean what am I renewing do I, when, when Lamentations 3 says oh your loving kindness and your mercies are excellent they are new every morning great is your faithfulness am I renewing my mind every morning with God's faithfulness and God's loving kindness you see where it can take me to all kinds of places the process of asking those questions of myself, what's new, renewing in my mind? Where am I now? Am I being conformed to this world? How am I being conformed to this world? How, am I, how is my mind going? Asking yourself all those questions, the who, what, when, where, why questions, is meditation. That's what meditation is. And meditation, the tool of meditation is sifting the ore that you get with this, you're, you've broken the ore of this verse into these fine pieces with this good dictionary. And you, now you're getting, some, you're getting some good ore there and some fine ore that you can deal with. Now you need to sift that. And that's meditation. The, the, <clears throat> the idea of meditation that works best for those of us that are, that are from rural areas is a, a cow chewing its cud. A cow has a number of stomachs, I think two stomachs, I don't know, more than one. But it's the idea, of it eats something and, and swallows it and then brings it back up and chews it some more and then takes it down and then brings it back up. It's called chewing your cud, uh, chewing the cud. So, but I can find verses that talks about meditating on the word all day long. Well, how, what, how does that work? Well, it just means, I, I read this morning in my quiet time, Romans 12, 2, about renewing my mind. All day long, I'm going to just chew on that idea of, of, you know, how's my mind doing renewing? Or am I thinking old thoughts? Or am I thinking new thoughts? Uh, am I thinking about what is good and honorable and true and perfect and those things? And I bring that back up and just chew on it and, and ask myself the questions. What about me? What, about, what am I doing? With being, am I being conformed to this world in my business? Well, everybody cheats. Or am I being conformed to this world in, in my marriage? Uh, you know, put down humor is a thing with the, the world now. You make fun of your spouse. Uh, wives call their husbands idiots and everybody laughs on TV. Uh, that's conformed to this world if I do that to my, my tech girl, my right hand. 
she's ignoring me. Uh, so the idea of chewing on it, meditating on it, bringing it up again, chewing on it some more, is asking these questions. So Philippi, uh, uh, Philippians 4, 8, that says, let your mind dwell on these things. That idea of let your mind abide there, let it sit there, let it chew that, and then let it, let it chew it again later, and then bring it up and chew it again later. Chew it until you get all the nutrients you can find out of it. That's meditation. It's not a fancy thing. It's not with, you got to have incense and music in the background. All it means is you're just chewing on the word and churning that up and rethinking on that, praying about it, then bringing it back up and praying on it again. And that's meditation. Now, if you go to the, the next page, you come to application. You, you meditate on it and you say, okay, a return on my life. We're on page 61. You're going, okay. I, I've meditated on it, on the word uh, to, uh, conform to this world. I've meditated on that. Now, application is an action that I want to take for me and for my situation. And I, I set a determined set of actions as an application. I'm going to apply this to me. So I have, I dig in the word, I get the truth, I sift that word with tools, then I meditate on what I've found, and off that meditation I come to a personal application of, Lord, I want to do what it's telling me I should do or should not do. That's personal application. And then you say, now Lord, uh, if it's stuff I, I've been doing what I shouldn't have been doing, that's confess. I need, Lord, that is sin. I need that gone. Thank you that that's forgiven on the cross. Praise the Lord that that's, that's gone. Now, praise the Lord the Holy Spirit is in my life helping me to be transformed by the renewing of my mind. Help me. Uh, uh, that's the application of my situation. So in on the top of page 61... Asking myself the questions, using my mind, that, that's, that principles of the questions. What are the aspects of your mind that are to renew? Well, my mind is my knowledge. Well, what do I need to renew? Maybe I need to go to a Bible study methods class so I can get my knowledge, not just information, but knowledge of the scriptures. What's my understanding? Uh, what are my perceptions? What are my opinions and, opinion and views? I may have to evaluate my political views and say, wait a minute, uh, maybe I need to stop hating Democrats. And maybe I need to be a, take a biblical approach to them. What is that approach? I need to go find out. That's my application. Well, no. We want to be vehement and hateful and nasty that's conformed to this world system. You see, I pick politics out of nowhere, but it could be on anything. My application would be, Lord, I want your help, the Holy Spirit, to be in me to transform my mind to do this. That's application. Now, the questions, I put you questions to consider. What is good in the will of God? Because it, it says... This is good and acceptable will of God. Okay, uh, it says, uh, "Be con uh, transformed by the renewing of your mind." Uh, this is the will of God, which is good and acceptable in that. So, if you go, wait a minute, good, acceptable, and perfect are modifiers of the will of God. So, I ask myself the question: What is good in the will of God? And you could just sit, ask yourself that question: What's good in the will of God for me? And if you say, well, it's, it's, it's good, it's great stuff, then why are we as Christians afraid of the will of God for our lives? Because if I am in the dark doing business with God, I'm afraid of what God's will is for me. Maybe. I am. Well, if it's good, why am I afraid? Well, because he might want to take something away from me that my mind is conformed to. And so the perfect good will of God 
might take me away from a goodie. So do I have an application to do there? Yes, I do. What is, what is acceptable in the will of God? Acceptable to who? Acceptable to me? Well, then God is not sovereign. If God is sovereign, it means he's king, he's in control, he decides what's good. I am the servant who does what I'm told. Remember we talked about bond servant of God. He's a voluntary slave. So the master decides what's acceptable, the slave doesn't. And then, uh, what is it for you personally? This is your personal application. Now, you've got to be careful here with, per with application because most of us have a tendency to look at something and say, oh, renew your mind or give up this or do this or do that. And we think, boy, that would be perfect for Jason. No way. We have fallen in the trap of judging Jason and then taking a spiritual truth and saying, well, I can ignore it for me, but boy, this really would be good for Jason. What does that make me? That makes me a Pharisee who's a hypocrite because I'm not applying the word to me, but I'm applying it to my brother or sister. And, and I'd be happy to put a heavy load on him and forget about what it's saying to me because I don't want to meditate on what it says to me. I don't want it to apply to me I'd much rather have it apply to somebody else, right? So we have to be careful with application that it's, it's what is it to me? God wants to do business with me. Now, when he does business with me, then I'll be ready to be used as a channel of grace and mercy to a, a wretched guy like Jason. <laughs> Pick on you Okay, but you see where I'm going. So with your application, be careful. Because Satan would love for you to apply everything to, boy, do I know somebody who needs this verse. Okay? Boy, does this, does this verse apply to so-and-so? Just be careful with that. You say, Lord, I want to do business with you with renewing my mind and not being transformed or not being conformed in my life. Because those verses are not a command. If you go through those words again, it is not a command for you to be uh, worried about somebody else's mind conformed and somebody else's being transformed. It's concerned for your mind being transformed. And first, verse 1 is your body being offered as a sacrifice. So personal application takes us to the last page. I want to give you a tool. This is a fun tool, uh, but it, it makes a lot of sense. If, if you want to go through a set of questions about, a, does this apply to me? Does this apply to my life? Here's some questions. Space pets. Uh, ask yourself, is there a message from God directly to me in this text? We just cut apart Romans 12.2. That's just a bunch of words unless God's Holy Spirit is going to apply it to me. And I ask the question, Lord, what do you want me to do with these words? That's application. So I ask myself, there's an anagram, space pets. And I ask the question, are there any sins I need to confess? So I'd go to that and say, conform to this world. Are there some, some issues of conformity to this world that I need to confess? Which just means agree to that, that sin. Uh, I confess my joy of violence. Now, it's interesting that as a Christian, 50 years in, I, I enjoy violent movies. Okay, What was my issue before I was a Christian? anger and violence I would be happy to blow your head off absolutely happy to and all of a sudden I'm I'm enjoying violence vicariously I need to deal with an issue of my heart maybe it's lust maybe it's maybe it's pride maybe it's anything but 
Ask the question, are there sins I need to, to confess? P, are there promises I need to claim? There's some great promises in Scripture. Are there attitudes I need to change? My attitudes. Uh, maybe anger, maybe it's lust, maybe it's pride. Maybe what, what attitudes do I need to change? And these are all prayerful things. Lord, are there sins in this I need to confess? Are there promises I need to claim? Are there attitudes I need to change before you? Are there commands I need to obey? Now, those words, uh, Romans 12, 2 and 1. Those are imperatives in the Greek. These are not suggestions. Do not be conformed. That is a command of God. That is not a suggestion. So I go, wow, you are telling me as a command not to do that. Am I willing to be obedient to you? Now, if I'm not willing to be obedient, that is the definition of disobedience, and disobedience is sin. So God has used that verse to bring about an application in my life that points out there's an issue. Now, maybe I need to go to my brother Jason and say, Jason, man, I was reading something, and I got, I, there's an issue that I just am having a struggle with giving up. or a str That's what fellowship is for. That's what encouragement is for. That's what iron sharpening iron is for. Uh, going to pastor. I got, a, I got an issue from, the scripture spoke to me with an issue, Tony, and I need your help. What's his reaction going to be? <clears throat> Fantastic. God's word is making an impact in your life. Is that good news? Yes, it is good news. That's where your Bible study method, you're not just reading a devotional in the morning and saying, well, that was nice with my coffee, and I can forget that. No, the, the scriptures are changing your life. Uh, are there examples I need to follow in this E? Are there prayers I need to pray? I always like that one. Is this something I need to take to the altar? Are there errors I need to avoid? If I go there, I will run into that. So there's an error I need to avoid. Are there truths I need to believe? And that's a great one. If God says he's going to do something, I need, Father, help me believe that. Help me really believe that. Are there shouts of praise I need to give God? And that's the end. That's where your application, your, your, your Bible study, your meditation, your application always, always, always leads you to worship. Even if it's the darkest thing and God is dealing with breaking you, the very fact that he is alive and active in your life and concerned and you're concerned and these are things go, man, this is a struggle, but thank you, God, that you give me the strength. The Holy Spirit is dwelling in me. It's his power. It's, it's, it's you renewing my mind. It's, boy, thank you, Lord. And if it's sin, I've, I admit that's sin. Thanks for, for your son dying on the cross for that. For me, a sinner. And that takes me to worship. It doesn't take me to guilt takes me to worship because I, it's taken care of. It's been paid. So app, your Bible study, your meditation, your application always takes you to worship. Never takes you to guilt. God does not use it for guilt. Conviction, yes. Conviction to make a confession and to take an action in your life, absolutely. That's God's business. God never wants us to feel guilty. He wants us to feel convicted. Now, the last thing I want to share in the last just few minutes is a kind of a warning. And I, I have this illustration right here. On page 62, the bottom of page 62, sifting ore through maturity screens. And off to the right, I say... Uh, uh, look for yourself, what God has for you at your level of maturity. Don't worry what others may get when you're talking, application for yourself. Now, if you're a teacher 
and you say, I need to teach this. I need to meet with Darnell and teach him this, okay? I need to be careful as a teacher not to teach Darnell at the level of maturity I'm at. I need to teach Darnell at the level of maturity he's at. Does that make sense to you? I need to be careful of that. Because if I'm teaching Darnell and I want to convict him, I want to give a message, I don't want to exhort him to deal with an issue that's an issue that I'm dealing with after 50 years of walking with the Lord. And Darnell's, you know, uh, been walking with the Lord for two years. Well, he's got a lot more to deal with than the minutia of, of what God's dealing in my life. Now, this maturity screens, I want to use this ex example. Uh, if you look closely at these, these are, these are OR uh, evaluation screens. And what they do is they stack. You can see um, this top one, this, uh, the top one is a real coarse screen. The next one is finer, the next one is finer, the next one is finer. Until you get way down to the bottom, 325 is, it's, boy, it's a fine screen, right? So what they do is they have a stack, and they pour the ore in the top. And the big stuff is stopped by the big screen, and it filters through to the next level, and that's stopped by the next size screen. And so you end up with big rocks, little rocks, little rocks, little rocks, fine powder. You everybody got that picture? Okay. When we're a brand new Christian, God pours the ore of our life into the scriptures. We're reading the scripture, and we, we, we got big rocks to deal with, big sins that are really obvious things, but they're new to us, and they're big things that God wants us to deal with. Me, anger, murderous intent. I mean, those are big things, right? Uh, it, it might be uh, some, some major thing. I'm, I'm a thief. And all of a sudden, God is, gets a hold of me, and I say, well, you know what? I need to stop stealing. Well, Tony was, uh, was sharing about a guy who, in our church who had, had embez been embezzling from this company for years. You remember that? And, and he goes, and he's convicted. He goes and confesses that, and goes to jail. That's the world. But spiritually, God took a big rock and matured him, and now he's dealing with something at a finer level. So if I've had 50 years of going through God sifting me, I may be dealing with little bitty minutia of attitudes and just tiny little things. You know, Billy Graham is dealing with temptations and in, in, in thoughts and attitudes that I'm, I'm dealing with. I don't want to kill somebody. I mean, you know, see what I'm saying? Well, I need to be careful that for myself, I, I, I don't want to be saying, well, I don't want to worry about these big things, God. Get, get down to my tiny little things. And God say, no, 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 no. I need to deal with these big things. You need to confess these big things before we can do business with the little things. Oh, no, I want to be a spiritual giant, so I want to deal with what little things have you got for me? God's saying, I can't deal with the little things until I have confessed on the big things. And so we need to be careful not to judge somebody else and try to take them. I remember when I was a fairly new Christian, and I really didn't understand the ministry of the Holy Spirit, I would walk into a dorm room, and uh, you know, my, my young believer that I was discipling uh, would say, well, I'm really having trouble with lust. And so I'd go and visit him in his dorm room, and there were pictures from Playboy all over the walls. And, and instead of saying, look, brother, you know, Duh, you know. I would go in and rip the, rip the pictures off the walls. I just, I was the Holy Spirit, man. I was just, I'll show you a conviction, and I just rip all that stuff off. It just wasn't very loving, um, or or kind. But I, I was taking a maturity level that I was at, even as a brand new Christian. I'd been a Christian for three months. Well, I was better off than a guy who's just become a Christian, as far as my maturity. God had dealt with some things in my screens, and I was maybe at the third level down in the screens. 
I had confessed my desire to kill my dad. I had confessed these, these uh, thoughts. I had confessed these big things. And so I was dealing with the next stage down. Well, if I've got a person I'm dealing with that is a brand new believer, he's back dealing with the big things. I shouldn't try to force him to a level of maturity finer than where he's at. Is that clear as mud? Okay. It helps you with you, and it helps. God, you bring me what I need to deal with right now. And when I do Romans 12, 2, I may do that and end up with a different set of applications for me to deal with than if you do. I may have different notes in my scripture than you do, and that's okay because these these are these are fifty years of notes. Uh, so don't be discouraged that your notes don't look like my notes. That's okay. Have notes. It's your treasure map. God is dealing with treasure for you that I may have found many years ago. And I may be finding treasure. An example of that was be these movies. Well, if I got a guy who's just become a Christian, I don't want to be talking to him about what kind of movies he goes to. I need to be talking about does he beat his wife. <coughs> you see what I'm saying? So don't apply our screen of maturity onto other people and don't try to take our screen of maturity beyond what God is dealing with us in our life. Don't say, oh, that's a sin. Well, I'll leave that sin, and I want to deal with smaller sins. No, you deal with the sins God gives you on the top of your maturity screen. I hope that makes sense to you. Um, your homework for next week. We're going to do John 11.35. Anybody know John 11.35? Anybody memorize it? What does that say? Jesus wept. It's really tough to memorize that one. Really tough to memorize that one. Okay. Your assignment is to take Jesus wept. Now, we had a long, you, you commented that that's a long verse, Romans 12, 2. You got two words, John eleven thirty five. 35. I promise you, we are going to have a hard time getting done in an hour with John eleven thirty five. 35. Okay? Okay. Uh, Ask your, bring your questions to it. Who, what, when, where, why, who. Jesus wept. There's a lot of who's there. Uh, what, why, and I'm going to get to this one. Especially, uh, you know, look for your nuggets, look for your deposits around the verse. Um, check the context of what's before and what's after the verse. Look for nuggets, deposits, veins, shafts that you... You say, oh, I found something that I want to really go deep in. I wrote a whole blog about those two verses. So don't go to my website and look it up and cheat. Uh, I found this great painting the guy did with this, this close-up of Jesus with his veil, and there's a single tear coming down. Jesus wept. So here's the question we're going to deal with next. Why did Jesus weep? I have heard sermons from pastors who are absolutely wrong based upon the scripture. Based upon the scripture of why Jesus weeps. And we're going to look at that. And then what does it have to do with me? This is the meditation and application. Why does he weep? And what has that got to do with me? I'm so pleased with you as a, a group. I hope you... I hope you're enjoying it. This is this is seven. We got uh, we got uh, four more sessions to do. Uh, more blessings to have um, ahead. So anyway, let's. Uh, who wants to pray and close us? All right. Lord, we just thank you for your word. Thank you for bringing it to life. Um, help us to meditate and slow down as. We continue to read and dissect and dig mines and shafts and to apply it to our own lives instead of pointing to others, as it's so easy to do. And Father, over these next two weeks, um, help us to really know why you did me and, uh, and to find truth in that. 
and just be with everybody over this break we do have uh, with them and their families. Thank you for this church and the classes it provides and with all the knowledge it teaches from. Help us to not just be hearers, but to go out and actually do what you say your word tells us to do. We just praise and thank you for all that we have. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jason.